Good morning and welcome to the Heritage Foundation to our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We of course welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our heritage.org website. Would ask everyone here in-house to make sure one last time that cell phones have been turned off. And of course we welcome questions or comments throughout these presentations uh, from our internet viewers and they're welcome to send those to speaker at heritage.org. And of course we will post the program on the Heritage website for your future reference. Hosting our guest today is Ted Broman, who is Senior Research Fellow in Anglo-American Relations in our Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom. He studies and writes on British foreign and security policies and, of course, Anglo-American relations. He joined Heritage after a decade as Yale University's Associate Director of International Security Studies, a research and teaching center dedicated to diplomatic, military, and strategic history. He is also a lecturer in history and international affairs. He has contributed essays and analysis to the American Pinion Monthly Commentary and to Great Britain's Yorkshire Post, as well as a variety of scholarly journals. He earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in history at Grinnell College, followed by a Master of Arts, Master of Philosophy, and Doctorate, all in history, from Yale University. Please join me in welcoming Ted Broman. Ted? Thank you very much, John. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the Heritage Foundation here, and a particular pleasure to introduce our guest today. David Kemble Bannerman is a member of the European Parliament for the East of England for the Conservative Party, at all office he has held since July 2009. Like so many skeptics about the European Union, he is profoundly international. He was born in Bombay, India in 1960, and he is, I am pleased to note, a joint product of the English, Scottish, and American educational systems as he holds an MA from the University of Edinburgh and attended the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania for a year. He served as chairman of the Bow Group, a center-right think tank within the Conservative Party from 1993 to 1994, and a special advisor to Sir Patrick Mayhew while he was Secretary of State for Northern Ireland from 1996 to 1997. In 2004, after a distinguished term in business, he joined the UK Independence Party, of which he was party chairman from 2005 to 2006. In 2011, he rejoined the Conservative Party. He is currently on the short list for the, pre for the prestigious Institute of Economic Affairs Brexit Prize, a 100,000 euro prize to be awarded to the best plan for a British exit from the EU after a future referendum. His plan is contained in his new book, Time to Jump, published late last year. As he has put it, Britain is like, quote, an unfortunate lobster in a boiling pot of water. You can see the lobster illustrated on the front cover here. Over the past 40 years, we have been sit we have quietly sitting in the water as the Federalist cooks have slowly turned up the temperature. Only now is the water coming to the boil, and only now do we have to jump if we are to preserve our status as an independent nation state. We thought we had joined a free trade area, a common market as it was called back in the early 70s. But as that morphed into the European Economic Community and then the political European Union, the idea that we were still a self-governing nation free to make and apply its own laws has become increasingly untenable. Unquote. To that, I can only add an amen and an apology. The amen is because our guest has shown the courage, though thanks to men and women like him, it takes less courage now than it used to, to tell the truth about the EU. The apology is because U.S. policy towards Brussels and Britain has ranged from 1960 from foolish to destructive to simply absent-minded. The most committed believers in the EU today are to be found in two places, Brussels and, sadly, Washington, D.C., cities thoroughly dedicated by their nature to top-down policies. Let's hope that our guest today will help awaken the U.S. just as he has helped awaken his native country. Please join me in welcoming David Campbell Bannerman, MEP, to the Heritage Foundation. David. Mr. Chairman, Ted, um, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to address you uh, at such a prestigious and powerful leading institution as the Heritage Foundation, and to be invited by such a familiar and appropriate body as the Thatcher Center within it. I intend to speak for about 30 minutes and then show you a film, a short film, um, about the myths of Brexit, as it's called, the British exit from the EU, which uh, I hope you find entertaining and informative. Um, I should start by praising the great Lady Thatcher. I had the pleasure to meet her a number of times uh, and the honor to have attended the majestic funeral at St. Paul's Cathedral. I know that she transformed our country for the better 
She gave it backbone again, self-belief, self-confidence, economic success, unleashed enterprise, and tamed appalling union excesses. I can just remember the 1970s under Labour and this feeling of drifting onto the rocks like a rudderless ship while she sees uh, the controls on the bridge and steers us clear in the nick of time. What was most unusual about Lady Thatcher is that she actually did what she said she was going to do. Uh, unusual, perhaps, for politicians. Um, turning to the USA, I'm a great lover of the US um, and your can-do attitude and uh, what I call the Jamestown resilience, especially in this weather in Washington. Um, I feel very at home here. Uh, I have family in Los Angeles, Seattle, many friends around the US. Um, as uh, Ted said, I'm, I was at Wharton and the University of Pennsylvania. I like to fly in Philadelphia, and I uh, was with the ROTC, the military side. Um, my political heroes are both uh, have American blood, uh, Winston Churchill and Benjamin Franklin, um, who was a brilliant and talented man. And I do think that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is a pretty good starting point for any country. Uh, perhaps we Brits need to work on the happiness bit a bit more. <laughs> and, uh, um, and of course, my, my own constituency around Cambridge has many great links, um, including the American Cemetery just outside Cambridge, where many of your fallen lie, including um, Joseph Kennedy and Glenn Miller, and commemorated there. I serve on the International Trade Committee of European Parliament and Security and Defence Committees. Um, I'm also on the Delegation of Relations uh, with Switzerland, uh, and I serve on the EEA, the European Economic Area Joint Parliamentary Committee. And the work I've done on those committees actually has informed or gave me the idea of this EEA light option, which sits somewhere between uh, Norway's uh, EEA uh, agreement, which got a formal agreement, and the Swiss bilaterals. And I'm going to come to that later. Now, I want to say, first of all, if I may, a bit about uh, why I don't believe the EU is actually a true friend to the USA. Um, then I want to talk about the bigger picture of global governance, the bigger picture which is above the EU, um, and, and then go on to look at the EEA light option. Now, given Washington is such an impressive military base, I wanted to call this talk the EU friend or foe. For just as a military sentry will challenge an approaching party, calling out, who goes there, friend or foe? The reaction is a judgment call for that sentry. Will the approaching group pretend to be friendly, only get into the camp, then wreak havoc, havoc and uh, destroy the base and capture its occupants? Or are they friends in need of a warm welcome and real hospitality? Trust is essential. And I want to make it clear in this speech that despite appearances, I do not believe the EU is a friend to the USA, but potentially a, a, a great rival, if not a potential foe. My experience to date in the European Parliament, seeing it uh, firsthand and observing the EU from within, <coughs> confirms my conviction on this. Now, I know the State Department has been a great advocate of greater European integration. Indeed, uh, declassified CIA uh, records show the CIA ha helped fund the uh, pro-European organization right from the start, back in the 50s, the European movement, that's called. But what was seen to be as a way of buttressing Europe in the Cold War, I think has become a dangerous, dangerous politics in the 21st century. The Obama administration has weighed in a number of times to argue it's in the US interest for the UK to stay in the EU. Many believe the administration is in any case Europeanizing the USA, modeling the US on the EU, particularly in its push on welfare. The previous US ambassador to London, Louis Sussman, said, we believe strongly it's in America's interest to have a strong EU. It's a key to trading and to certain diplomatic, intelligence, and military matters. And for our best ally not to be a strong voice there, frankly, we don't think it's in our interest. And then the current US ambassador, uh, Mr. Barzan, said, we, would b we benefit by a really strong UK voice in a strong EU. To me, it seems you need us in the EU to make it less bad. <laughs> 
The question I ask now is how do these people actually know? How, how do many in the British establishment know? Do they have any idea what kind of deal the UK could strike outside the European Union as its largest single trading customer, as an employer of a million Germans and 800,000 French citizens through UK trade, in terms of the mass cost savings that could be made by cutting 150,000 pages of EU overregulation and £118 billion of red tape. Surely that's an attractive vision. And the model I present here today, EA Light, is one that keeps the benefit of access to the EU single market for UK exporters, but only 8% of the British economy, 8%, relies on trade with the EU, and only 5% of British businesses, according to Business for Britain, actually trade with the EU, which means in theory we could, if we left the single market, we can slash up to 92% of regulation on British business, including many U US owned British businesses. Of course, Europe, which you tend to bracket together as one entity, one unit, seems benign and familiar. The EU, brings together many democratic nations, uh, Greece, Britain, France, for example. Um, it celebrates European culture and continuity. Um, it was the source of many of your immigrants, particularly in the 19th century. And there's a lot of crossover of, of nations, or NATO, for example. So the, nation, the notion of a United States of Europe, a USE, uh, was something that even Churchill envisaged, except, by the way, he never envisaged the UK being within it. If you actually look at the speech very carefully, he, uh, he said, stick with the Commonwealth. Um, <laughs> but USE must seem a familiar, recognizable entity, something so comfy about it, a European version of the United States of America, a mirror image across the Atlantic. But if only USE was a USA, it isn't. The EU, EU is closer to a lighter, less onerous, weaker Soviet Union than it is to your fine US model of representative and constitutional democracy, individual freedom, the rule of law, free trade and enterprise. Again, more foe than friend. Vladimir Bukowski, who actually lives in Cambridge, which I represent in England, was a dissident who suffered 12 years in gulags. He regards the EU as a new Soviet Union. The commissioners as the Politburo, the European Parliament as a supreme Soviet. Um, now, I don't go as far as saying that, but his central point, uh, maybe you wish I would, but, <laughs> but his central point uh, is very valid, and that is that the Soviet Union, anticipating collapse, thanks to President Reagan and Maggie Thatcher, um, sought to live again by transforming itself into a social democratic force, which appears on the outside as acceptable, but in reality is a dangerous entity, one that significantly and seriously is anti-American at its core. And that, I think, is worth examining, that thesis. The EU is certainly a force of the progressive left, with former senior communists sitting as commissioners, uh, or as MEPs. Um, it is alleged that there are even mafia people as MEPs from former communist states sitting in the parliament. Now, I want to give you a few examples briefly on where I think uh, the EU is hostile to US interests in a whole number of areas. For example, do you know that the European Institute Instrument for <coughs> Democracy and Human Rights, funded by the EU, uh, to the tune of 1.1 billion over seven years, this instrument spends monies on, money on lobbyists in the US to pose your death penalty. The EU gave over 1.3 million euros to two organizations. Witness to in Innocence was one, and that got 850,000 euros. And Equal Justice, USA was another one, given 495,000 euros. In 2012, this instrument also funded political campaign groups in India, China, and Taiwan who lobbied for the abolition of the death penalty. Now, the EU is wholly opposed to the death penalty per se, uh, but I was only one of 34 MEPs that voted against this instrument in December last year, with 588 in favor. And I said in Parliament, well, the death penalty in the United States is the matter for the United States. 
Um, it is incredible that our taxpayers' money is being spent to lobby in America or elsewhere. I think it's totally wrong. International trade. Um, now, the EU has exclusive competence, as it's called, or power, over UK trade. We are unable, as a, a member of the EU, to do our own trade deals with anyone else. So the country that gave you the Industrial Revolution, globalization, wealth of nations, comparative advantage, cannot do a deal with even Dominica now, let alone with China. Though non-EU Switzerland and non-EU Iceland have done just that recently with China. So we cannot even do a deal with you in America, a trade deal. And a US-UK deal, as Niall actually pointed out just the other day, um, would go a lot further. We're talking about the UK is actually the largest single investor in the US uh, with a cumulative investment of $487 billion, uh, according to Congress. And in addition, you, the US, are our largest foreign investor with over 200 billion of UK-based investments. So we're not talking about the EU investing, it's, it's us, it's US, UK. And I'm on the International Trade Committee, and what's happening with the left on the Trade Committee, uh, who are often anti-capitalist and pro-green, is that they are causing EU trade negotiations to slow or even fail. Um, because these forces have applied a human rights clause to trade deals uh, and an environmental clause on, on emissions. Um, and as a result, the EU-Canada free trade agreement slowed to a crawl and was nearly abandoned over human rights issues. New Zealand fears losing all of its agreements if it offends what is called human rights obligations. Um, I worked on the Colombia-Peru uh, trade deal where the left wanted um, the deal suspended every time a journalist or trade union fell over. Um, you know, it was literally ridiculous. You can op cannot operate trade on that basis. And India is worried not only about human rights, but about emissions targets as well. So trade should be about jobs and spreading prosperity, not about interfering in others' domestic politics. It's a new form of imperialism, I feel. So do not be surprised if when the bulk of the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership deal between the EU and US has been negotiated, and I gather the next round is 10th of March they're negotiating, um, that they demand that you scrap your death penalty. When the Japanese ambassador to the EU said to me, well, they're worried in Japan about having to scrap their death penalty because of the EU-Japan free trade agreement. Um, this should not be part of trade. What about the economy? This is another area where I think the EU is damaging to US interests. Um, the reality of the EU is that it did well back in the 70s, 60s, 70s, but it's plummeting. Its share of world wealth has plummeted from 36% in 1980, over a third of the world's GDP, to a forecast 15% by 2020. It might even be less with the euro crisis. Um, Over-regulation red tape in terms of excessive employment laws, health and safety, environment policy, are destroying Europe's competitiveness and exporting jobs out of Europe. Nor does it help the EU has failed to have its own account signed off for 18 years in a row by the European Court of Auditors. And this is due to high levels of fraud, irregularities as they call it, goat herds that have no goats, roads which don't exist, that sort of thing. The reality, I believe, is the EU is a dead horse economically, and we in the UK are shackled to it. The euro has been a disastrous experiment. It's led to youth unemployment in Spain and Greece, hitting 60%, 60%, and the rise of political extremism. The economy of Greece has shrunk by a quarter, by 25%. And they were not allowed to leave the euro because that would bring down French and German banks. The euro is a political project rather than an economic project. And this is deeply concerning. I believe that a return to national currencies for many of these countries would unleash an economic recovery through cheaper holidays, bargain properties, and competitive exports. But the EU's political agenda will not allow it. 
Even the German economic uh, machine, the export machine, which has benefited so much from the Eurozone, without a soaring Deutschmark, you know, choking off exports, even that is now faltering. The working population of Germany is forecast to plunge from 54 million today to 39 million people by 2060. The UK, incredibly, is set to overtake both France and Germany in terms of population to be the most populous European nation by 2060, with 77 million, that's um, bar Russia, of course. And the UK should also become the Europe's largest economy by 2030. It is known that Germany has also got unfunded pension liabilities of nearly 8 trillion euros. It's actually 7.6 trillion euros. Um, and resistance is growing to paying illegal bailouts under the Lisbon Treaty. I think on the pensions issue alone, it's worth leaving the EU. I mean, the reality is that Britain is a cash cow, will become an EU cash cow on pensions. Thanks to Lady Thatcher, um, about 60% of UK pensions are privately funded. But in France, it's about 5%. Um, and you're looking at figures like Germany will have 1.6 workers to every retired person. Uh, by 2050, and France 1.9 workers to every retired person. So guess who will be left carrying the baby? It will be the UK. And when it comes to financial services and financial markets, critical to both our economies, the EU really shows its true nature. A former Prime Minister responsible for the Alternative Investment Fund Directive actually said this. He said, this is from the EU. We want to downsize the city of London. We do not like your Anglo-Saxon methods, were his words. Anglo-Saxon means you as well. <laughs> um, and the EU has seized on this banking crisis. It introduced a lot of regulation um, and taxes, like the financial transactions tax, which may drain the city of London up to £60 billion which we said we're not going to be part of, but if, since we're trading with the EU nations, we'll be wrapped up in it. Um, and it's created all these bodies in insurance and European securities, and European banking agency. There's a huge power grab that's been going on since the financial crisis. And this is primarily political. Another example of a hostility and distrust to the US is the Galileo satellite project. Um, the only reason it exists is they wanted to rival your, the US uh, G GSP uh, pro the uh, satellite project there. Um, and they spent 14 billion euros so far on a white elephant. No one knows how much it's going to cost, finally. And it doesn't work very well. It's not as good as yours. And uh, you, you even got um, the CEO of one of these top companies involved in it saying, as, a, as reported by WikiLeaks to US diplomats, I think Galileo is a stupid idea that primarily serves French interests. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, he paid for the truth there, and uh, he lost his job. Um, but that is the truth. It is a, it is a, wasteful, um, uh, it is a wasteful exercise, and we can get rid of it uh, if we left the EU. On foreign affairs and defense, um, the, the direction the EU is traveling is quite clear from one reality. The foreign affairs minister of the EU, Baris Ashton, was former treasurer of the campaign for nuclear disarmament, CI, uh, CND. Um, these are the people that want to get rid of our nuclear deterrent uh, and also throw your cruise missiles out of Green and Common. Um, and the British Communist Party actually said that CND received KGB money. Um, so it's very concerning that you have what I call the Red Baroness uh, <laughs> um, uh, leading the new foreign service of the EU. And Maybe in Iran, getting rid of nuclear weapons, maybe she's ideal for that role. Uh, but I do, I am very concerned at what that means for our nation. And why does the EU actually even need a foreign service? Surely embassies are, represent national interests. So isn't this a super European super state being represented? I mean, you now have ambassadors. It used to be said they were heads of delegation. Now that's given way to ambassadors. You have ambassador now. And David O'Sullivan is going to take over here in Washington on behalf of the US. Yes, a bright man, but he's a smooth bureaucrat, not a Democrat. 
And uh, he, he has actually been involved in the European Commission, and this is where it's all going. And neither Barris Ashton nor David O'Sullivan have ever been elected to anything, as far as I can see. And that's where it's going, as opposed to your more democratic model. Um, now, this EAS employs 4,000 staff. It has 140 delegations around the world. It costs 5.3 billion euros over seven years. Um, and this is compared with the British Foreign Office, of about, about the same size, but which is shrinking to 4,285. And the Spanish only have 118 embassies, not 140. So this is a power grab, and it's taken away from our diplomatic service. And that is deeply uh, concerning. And their job in life is to sell the EU, not nation states, including wonderful projects such as the euro and the common agricultural policy. Mm -hmm. um, so again, that is very concerning. And they have taken a lot of na nation state roles in UN bodies, such as the World Health Organization, the International Labor Organization the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. So instead of a British voice on those bodies or a French voice, you're getting the EU voice. And I think that is very bad from America's point of view because your greatest ally, the UK, is being lost within this remote and undemocratic body. And even on, the, on defense, they're talking of an EU single army with real seriousness now. I'm on the defense committee. They've called, you know, why aren't they, we've had people saying, why haven't you used the battle groups, the EU battle groups? The cry for blood on behalf of Europe it is very scary. And this idea of pooling and sharing means basically we can't afford a proper army, so we're all going to pool and share. But the real agenda is to drive a common European army. And that is the last piece of the jigsaw on the European superstate uh, um, map. And uh, that really concerns me. And as for the N NSA spying row, well, wasn't it the Europeans who invented embassies to spy on trade rivals, the Venetians? <laughs> um, I think there is a lot of na naivety and arrogance about that. And for them to come to you in Washington and lecture you, I think is, is a, a nonsense. Um, you know that the Justice Committee of the European Parliament, you may, may not know this, wanted to have Ed Snowden on a video link recently. I don't think it's actually happened. I think he's gone back. But, you know, is it a friend when they're asking him questions like, are you being treated well? Is there anything I can do to help you? What more can you tell us? I mean, this is not the, the way a friend operates, is it? Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think, in all of those respects, the EU is good for the USA. I turn now to my second theme, which is that there is actually a bigger game afoot, and that is the a more sinister game of, of global governance. Um, and I, I quote here quite extensively from an excellent book, Sovereignty or Submission, Will Americans Rule Themselves or Be Ruled by Others? You probably know Dr. John Fonte of the Hudson Institute well. Um, he came to Brussels, I had the pleasure of meeting him, and I do believe what his analysis of global governance and the threat to us is, is really very, very scary and very, very real. And it actually, as a member of the European Parliament, a skeptical member of the European Parliament, um, it really showed me what was actually happening. And it's a much bigger game than just the EU. Um, so, it's, you know, the, the thing is, the EU is essentially a prototype, as Fonte says, a, a, a model for um, global governance. It's what global governors around the world actually look to as being the ideal way to go. Uh, and it, but it is a model that overrides democratic legitimacy and, uh, and sidelines the people that um, Democrats are meant to represent. And I believe the winners are bureaucrats, judges, and huge corporations, uh, both private and non-governmental non organizations, NGOs, uh, corporations in the wisest sense. What I can say uh, from my experience as an MEP, that there is indeed a battle going on bef between global governance and sovereign democratic states. Um, and that is a very uh, serious issue, and it's a battle we're not winning. Uh, you know, it's something we, we really need to be alert to. 
I've got great respect for the former President Klaus of the Czech Republic, I'm sure we have as well, and he was treated appallingly at the European Parliament. But what he said really echoed with me to the MEPs. I was there. Are you really convinced, is what he said, that every time you take a vote, you're deciding, deciding something that must be decided here in this hall and not closer to the citizens that are inside the individual European states? The present decision-making system of the European Union is different from a classic parliamentary democracy tested and proven by history. There is no European demos and no European nation. And hundreds of MEPs walked out at that point, which just says, says it all, isn't it, about democracy. Look also at how the EU showed total ruthlessness at getting rid of prime ministers. Papandreou in Greece, they had to get rid of him because they were going to offer a referendum on the austerity package. It might have brought down the euro. So they replaced him by a, a commissioner, a EU commissioner. Um, Papandreou, Pater, Papa Demos replaced him. Then there was another EU commissioner, Mario Draghi, who replaced Berlusconi in Italy. So the EU really thinks it has the power to actually d displace elected democratic politicians and put in its own placement. Draghi, of course, is also an EU commissioner. Um, it's worth saying, Fonte also points out, the G20, which is an international body and seems quite sort of friendly, uh, uh, is actually dominated by eight EU nations. And why does the commission president of the EU, Barroso, why does he have to attend? Why does the Council of the EU, uh, Van Rompuy, have to attend? Um, you know, and then you've got IMF. The head of the IMF is a French uh, lady, as you know, uh, Christine Lagarde, um, as was her predecessor. The World Trade Organization, another commissioner, Pascal Lamy, and the same Mario Draghi as chairman of the Financial Stability Board. So I think what Fonte says here is actually scary, that this is proof of global governance. The EU is being uh, used to actually as leverage towards a more international battle. And I think what is really key here is in the language. I'm happy with working internationally, internationally, between nation states. That doesn't compromise sovereignty. But the EU is supranational, meaning it acts above nation states. Or you could call it a transnational body, uh, meaning it acts uh, across or beyond nation states. And this is important because when President Lincoln um, talked of there being no political superior, sovereignty meaning ultimate power, well, these people have a different uh, uh, goal. Global governance establishes a community, political community, above nation states. And we're talking here of post-democratic states and post-modern governments. And it's very, very scary, the whole issue. He has touched on the fact that this is an old idea, of world government's an old idea, and I think global governance is different to world uh, government as such. But, you know, it is out there, and it is real, and you look at it historically, it, it's, it has quite a track record. Um, and there is a lot of talk of pooling and sharing sovereignty, rather like the armed forces, which actually means surrendering sovereignty uh, to this higher body. Fonte talks of the International Criminal Court. Um, it has no responsibility to anyone. Uh, Tony Blair last week was arrested, in inverted commas, by a British citizen. I don't know if you saw that. It wasn't one of you, was it? No, no, no. But, but, <laughs> but, you know, it does worry me that, you know, people think that there is a sort of higher legal uh, level where people are, which people like prime ministers or presidents are responsible to. The Spanish prosecutor Garza, um, tried to arrest Donald Rumsfeld. He tried to arrest the Chilean president, Pinochet. And this is all to do with universal jurisdiction, uh, which Belgium has too. You know, you go to a court in one country and you can actually be empowered to arrest people around the world. Um, so I think this is wrong, and, and Fontier is right to push along these, um, along these uh, ways. But the... The, again, what is happening is the human rights lawyer and the bureaucrat is winning over Democrats, you know. And I also feel that the soldier, 
Uh, certainly in Britain, there's been case after case where soldiers have been pursued for Iraq or Afghanistan by a lot of our own lawyers. Um, and I feel, you know, this is an agenda which I think is treasonous in my view. It's twisted and malicious, and it works against our ability to defend our own country. And I think, I think that is wrong. And what Fonte calls lawfare, as opposed to warfare, I believe, yes, that must end. We have our own problem. There's courts everywhere and human rights everywhere in the EU. We have the European Court of, of Human Rights, you've probably heard of, in Strasbourg. Um, and that's trying to give prisoners the vote, murderers, paedophiles, give them a vote. But this is a civil right, not a, uh, a human right. And uh, we've had terrorists like Abu Hanza, who we're trying to send to you, as, and uh, Abu Qatada. <laughs> um, but, but it's made it almost near impossible, these human rights laws, to actually expel these people from our own country. We've lost control uh, over our own country. Our own justice minister, Chris Grading, is right to talk of a European law mission creep, um, you know, where they're actually taking too much power away from democratic nations. The European Court of Human Rights, by the way, I understand it has a backlog of about 170,000 cases, would you believe, compared to, say, the Supreme Court in the UK or the one down the road at the US, who have less than 100 cases a year. There's a huge backlog. Um, and the British government's lost 202 cases which have benefited murderers, terrorists, paedophiles, and rapists. So where is this all going? Um, I think also the English legal system, which you share, the Magna Carta, etc., has been put at risk, and that is wrong. Um, the other thing is that it's the idea of social and economic rights being human rights. And if you have that, then why do you need Democrats? Why do you need policies? Why do you need elections? I mean, for example, the, the idea that um, having um, annual vacation or parental leave or health care provision is a human right, I think is ridiculous. It's a social and economic right, and the, the democratic political process should change resources as appropriate to meet those uh, needs. But it should not be just a right overseen by judges. And I think this would actually undermine our whole democratic system. This is exactly what the EU's fundamental charter of human rights, which sits in the Lisbon Treaty, is about. And the EU has a fundamental rights agency. They're everywhere, this, these human rights bodies, which explores human rights not in terms of freedom of speech, but in terms of poverty, immigration, stereotyping, diversity, training, media reporting, police training, and educating children. Again, a distortion of the whole uh, idea of human rights. To me, this is a human rights fest, as I call it, uh, and it's taking away our freedoms. In fact, it's actually depriving us of the very human rights we all value including hate crimes. I have a Cambridge friend who's a barrister who's been working on cases like the British Airways Cross case, where the turban and hijab were acceptable, but wearing the Christian cross was not. Um, a street preacher, Michael Overd, who was arrested for reading from the Bible in the street, and that was regarded as being hate speech. This is going on all the time, so I think this is a major challenge. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me just um, round up with the third element, which is about the model I want to paint, the EA light model. This is relevant to, obviously, the EU and to global governance. Um, I think, first, that the British Prime Minister is right to offer a, an in-out referendum on the EU issue in Britain. You have to be nearly 60 to have voted in the last major referendum on the EU. Um, so it's about time, and the British people want this. At the moment, Labour and Lib Dems, Liberal Democrats in the House of Lords are doing everything they can to frustrate a referendum bill, which I think is a total disgrace, despite the fact 85% of British people, left or right, want a referendum. So just to explain, if the British Conservative government win the next election, May next year, uh, the policy is this. We will renegotiate a package with the EU. We'll take back some powers. That's the plan in immigration, employment law, social law, that, you know, in a whole number of areas. That package will take a, a year or more to negotiate. 
and then it will be put to the British people in the referendum by the end of 2017. Um, now, this is not easy. I mean, Holland said this week, Holland's office said this week, that uh, they want Britain to remain in Europe, but it cannot happen at the price of dismantling Europe, is what he said, of dismantling Europe. And the truth is EU federalists would rather we leave the EU than actually unpick it, because if we get more powers back, uh, France, uh, not, well, probably other countries, the Dutch, the Danish, etc., might follow suit. So the, from the Federalist point of view, they're quite nervous about renegotiation, but I do think it is feasible to renegotiate. But, it, it, you know, will it be a good enough package is the issue that will be negotiated in the referendum. So um, I think that is good. I'm painting a, a, a here an option that is negotiated out, um, and basically the nub of it is this. Uh, it's a free trade agreement that sits somewhere between Norway's EA Light agreement, which is quite a, which has been lasting for about 20 years, and Switzerland has about 120 bilateral agreements. And the EA Light sits between that. It means that we can leave the single market, the EU single market. Uh, if you leave the EU single market, then, as I've said before, the 92% of the British economy does not get involved with trade with the EU, in theory, can strip out a lot of the red tape. If you're in the single market, you know, all of those companies, all of those people have to apply EU regulation. Um, so that is one of the main benefits. A, a greater control over immigration. The Swiss have a referendum on the 9th of February. Um, actually, to ban mass immigration is going to be quite interesting because it will cause chaos over freedom of people's um, deals with the EU. So we'll see what happens on the 9th of February. Um, so I'm arguing that the 100, there's 150,000 pages of EU laws, directed regulations and judgments that we could actually go through and strip out. And I think that'd be a major uh, benefit. The working time directive, um, they've interfered a lot in our market, the temporary workers directive, large combustion plant. You know, we could actually get our economy in a much better shape and pay off a lot of the deficit, in my view, by slashing this red tape. Um, we could just run our own country again, you know, get back our freedoms, our democracy. Um, but all we need to do is secure a trade deal with the EU, which is the EA Light. We actually export more to the rest of the world now, Britain. Um, you know, there's more Jaguars coming to America, there's more going to India, China, Brazil, and in fact our, our trade with the EU is dropping. It was 10% of our uh, economy, it's now 8%, as I said, it's falling to 5%. Uh, and of course the EU is pretty stagnant again at the moment. Um, so I think this is a, a way to go. I think it's a... a, a a pretty practical plan. I've got a track changes version of the Nor Norway's EA Light agreement on my website, timetojump.org. And you can see what I, it's, it's actually quite a simple process to, to work around that to get this lighter version of EA Light. Um, and I think we would be much better off um, as a country. Um, and uh, I think we'd be freer. And uh, we will be free to do better deals with yourself and to appeal to the Commonwealth and the Anglosphere. I should just say, just to wind up, that the Commonwealth, uh, the, the, you know, the old British Commonwealth, um, actually its economies now are greater collectively than the EU as of last year. So India... Canada, Australia, they're all doing very well. South Africa, Nigeria even, uh, is growing now. Um, there's huge potential in the Commonwealth with common bonds, English language, English laws, English business practices in many ways. And I think there's real potential there, and that is not illusory. The Indian middle class is half what the EU is now, just its middle class. And by 2050, it should be more than the EU is now in total. So the future is beyond the EU. Um, all we want is a trade deal with it, such as EA Light, and then we'll be freed up to be global, to think globally. And I think the Anglosphere is alive and well, and thank you for attending today. Um, I think that uh, we have an exciting future, but there are serious democratic threats coming out of the EU, and we need to leave it as soon as possible. Thank you very much.
Uh, in just a second, uh, we'll cue a, a very short video uh, by our guest on uh, some of, is it all 10 myths of the EU? Or, <laughs> yeah, well, or is it, it's most of them. That, yeah. that, would, that would be a rather long, <laughs> a rather, rather long video. Uh, we'll cue the video on the myths of the EU, the, uh, and then we should have just a, uh, time for a couple questions. Yeah, sure. Afterwards. Sure, thank you. I should just explain the, the, the video. Um, as I say, the referendum debate is beginning to uh, um, head off, really. I mean, you know, it might be tw 2017 before it starts, but, but there's a lot of debate going on already about why we should be in the EU or not. And this addresses some of the myths, and I've interviewed Norwegian, Swiss, British uh, experts to get their view on what it would mean. And I think a lot of these arguments, the myths we use in Norwegian uh, debate in '94 when they joined the, uh, tried to join the EU, and they didn't uh, succeed then, and I don't think they'll succeed with the UK referendum. I think uh, they're running now. Are there any questions while um, we're, we're running the film? Stop if it, if it starts. Okay, yeah, okay. Quick question now, Brian Riley from Heritage work on trade policy. Yeah. I'm curious if your proposal, uh, is it something that could be copied and pasted as a model for the U.S., uh, for the proposed TTIP agreement, or are there any separate uh, suggestions you'd have for Americans as that is, is moving forward? Um, well, the, the model is more to, with our relationship with the EU, Britain, EU. But I mean, Norway and Switzerland are interested in EA Light. I know people there. And also, you know, frankly, the EU is breaking up in many ways. You've got the Eurozone, the core Eurozone, uh, that are getting closer together. And other nations might leave the EU, in theory, the Holland, Denmark, for example, and actually join something like EA Light. But I think you'd have to probably look more at the EFTA deals because we've probably joined the European Free Trade Agreement, uh, tree, Free Trade Area, and Association, EFTA Association. That's, they've got their own trade deals, and probably you, you should look at that. Yeah. David, I believe we've overcome our technical. Right, sorry, you had a technical. Uh, we have a choice, either renegotiated in or are negotiated out. But what if we did have to leave the EU? And this comes down to looking at the negotiated out. What would that mean for the UK? <laughs> Opponents of withdrawal from the EU have used many scare tactics, citing the dangers, such as we'd lose three million jobs, it would damage investment, that the UK would lack influence, and we will be all alone in the world. I want to take a more rational look at the facts and look specifically at Norway and Switzerland, who for decades have prospered and successfully managed a relationship outside of the EU. What can we learn from their experience? This film explores the options for a new relationship for the UK outside of the EU. These are exactly the sorts of scaremongering that used to go on. That if we didn't join the euro, well, the city would be disadvantaged, we wouldn't be able to trade with Europe, we'd lose our big time. The truth is that none of that happened. I'm very confident that Labour voters in the country want to see a radical change in our relationship with Europe. And it just means that because we're such a huge customer, with such a large trade deficit, that I think we've got a lot of a bargaining power. They need us almost more than we need them. And we have to have the confidence to be able to say that and not be kind of uh, taken in by people who say doom and gloom. The other member states will always want to trade with us. I think it's actually the EU who has to tell Britain why you wouldn't work outside, and Britain has to tell why, why we should work inside. I think it's uh, the opposite logic. You must be idiot if you really earn that much money from trading with a, with a partner and saying, if you don't want to play exactly the play I want us to play, then I do not want to sell anything to you anymore. 
we were told that we would lose 50,000 jobs nearly overnight if we didn't join. The, the European Union and Norway, we need each other. We need to trade, we need to cooperate, uh, and it, it's a two-way thing. Let's be honest, if they didn't have a decent trade deal with us, they'd be cutting their noses off to spite their face. In all the time I've been here, I have never heard anyone suggest that we wouldn't at least get the kind of deal that the Swiss have. As a European Union member, you would have to go through Brussels and ask Brussels, we should do more with Singapore, we should do more with the United States, and whereas we can directly uh, go to these countries. We would, on the day we left, be overwhelmed overwhelmingly the EU's biggest export destination. In a way, that statistic is the only fact you need. When you bear in mind that China grew at 6.6% last year, while the EU shrank, you can see that the Swiss are on to a good thing. I want plenty to do with the EU. It's just I don't want to be in it. And I fear that what will happen if we don't get this right in good time is that we will have a period of dysfunctional instability and a, a rise of the far right. And the project of bringing together, getting a closer, an ever closer union was not what people voted for in this country. Uh, but that is where we're going unless we put a stop to it and the time has come. So literally every continent in the world is growing except Europe and that is our tragedy. We've locked ourselves into this cramped, confined customs union which is the only bit that is dwindling. Britain would have lots of benefits if it had a different relationship with the European Union than it has today. I think one option would be to rejoin EFTA and from the basis of EFTA together with these other four countries, Switzerland, Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein, uh, trying to negotiate a purely trade-related agreement with the European Union that you, you lower taxes, you lower tariffs, not trying to harmonize every aspect of, of every company's and person's uh, life. Switzerland is a much better model than Norway, but we could do better than either. We could get a sui generis deal because we're much bigger, we're a much bigger export market, we're much more economically significant. But the other bonus, obviously, is that we get our democracy back. So I think we'd be terrifically well placed to have an extremely well connected country. We would be rejoining the wider world. You could uh, redesign your immigration policies, your free movement of person policies, uh, your environmental standards, you would be suddenly free again to, to do what is best for Britain and not what is best for the European Union. Uh, there's a long version of that on YouTube if you really want the full works, uh, but uh, hopefully it's informative. Uh, thank you, David. That's wonderfully done. We have time for just a couple quick questions and answers. General, who was there? Sure, yeah. Um, all right, Hartman, Con Congressman Stockman. Uh, what uh, would you um, estimate the percentage of nationally passed laws versus EU passed laws? Hmm. This is a very interesting question. It's hard to estimate it. Um, the British Parliament has put it at between 50 and 60 percent of our laws. Westminster laws comes from the EU. Uh, Germany has put it as much as 80%, um, various other countries about 70%. It's roughly, I think, two-thirds. Um, what happens with the EU is that directives are transposed into British law or Europe, you know, French law or German law, um, and regulations are directly uh, applied to the UK. So you can't even debate those. That's part of, you know, it's hundreds, thousands of regulations. We can't even debate in our own parliament. It's just applied to us. Um, but yes, this is a major issue that, you know, the British Parliament's been sidelined. It's, it's like just sort of, you know, half its business has been decided elsewhere and it doesn't even realise half the time. Um, but it is very serious. And, you know, we want our democracy back. Lou Coffee Heritage Foundation. Basically, more of a, a comment. I just find it very refreshing that you're here sharing this message in Washington, because I think a lot of American support, if you want to call it that, for the European project is just a lack of awareness and understanding of what it really is. If you take the issues that Americans associate themselves with, as you know, limited government, states' rights, transparency, direct elections, good use of taxpayers' money, these are all um, American attributes that you do not find anywhere in the European Union. And I think that if you continue to come over here, um, share this message, get your colleagues over here, meet people on the Hill, 
um, we can start turning this debate around and just bring awareness of what the European project has now become and why it's not in the US interest to keep deepening uh, this integration. So thank you very much for coming. No, thank you. No, absolutely. It's, it's good to be here and thank you for the invite to this uh, very prestigious organization. <laughs> I think that's a, a wonderful note to end on. Uh, I want to present our, our guest oh, uh, with a, with a uh, remembrance token uh, for future use, in, uh, perhaps in Brussels uh, or London or on, on a future visit to the Heritage Foundation. Thanks so, so much. Thank you so much.